Good afternoon, everyone, <clears throat> and welcome to Community Development, Housing, and General Government Committee meeting. All committee members are participating in purpose because a non-committee member, Council Member Barbara Burke, is participating virtually. The North Carolina General Statute states this meeting is a virtual or remote meeting and is being streamed live. Would the city clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Scipio. Present. Councilmember Mundy. Present. Councilmember Clark. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Adams. Here. Uh, today's agenda, we have five consent items and we also have four general agenda items. Uh, it's the practice of committee and council to always start with the consent agenda first. Um, I have C1, C2, and C3 being asked uh, to be pulled. Are there any others? If not, may I have a motion to approve the balance I'll, of the agenda? I'll move approval of the balance. Second. Is the mood improperly second? Will the clerk, my bad, be voting electronically? <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> And would the clerk please call the first item, please, C1. Item C1, resolution electing the 2022 inductees to the, to the Winston-Salem Arts, Culture, and Entertainment Memorial Walk of Fame. Ms. C Councilmember Scipio. Uh, yes, I had just one question on that is, what determines the number of honorees in a particular year? I saw that historically one year we had one honoree and another year we had up to five. I just didn't know what determined how many we honored. Good afternoon, Chairwoman Adams and members of the City Council. Uh, Council Member Scipio, by policy, that we limit it to five a year. So you can go up to five, up but to five. we don't have to always choose five. Yes, That's the committee's decision. That's and correct. it's a city, of, I mean, it's a committee of residents. That's correct. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Any other questions? Councilman Mundy. Yes, I would like a brief presentation just to present to the public those who are being honored and, and those who were nominated. Yes, sir. And, and also express thanks to the uh, committee that put the work into choosing these folks. Yes, sir. Sandra, can we pull that up? <clears throat> okay. Uh, next slide, Sandra. So just wanted to briefly go over the program before we go into the, uh, the nominees and the finalists. So the Winston-Salem Arts, Culture, Entertainment Memorial Walk of Fame was created by the City Council in November 2015 at the uh, idea of, of Mayor Pro Tem Adams. Um, the program does recognize deceased city residents who made significant contributions to the arts and entertainment industry. And as you know from, from the uh, classes that have been inducted here in recent years, it's located on the Cherry Street sidewalk next to the Benton. So in terms of how the process works, the process opens in January. Um, nominations are received, uh, given I think about you know, a month or two for, to receive nominations and then a diverse panel of citizens who represent you know, various artistic disciplines and fields within the entertainment industry. They review the, uh, the applications. Uh, and as you'll see today, then a, a slate of, of uh, finalists is presented to the Community Development Housing General Government Committee for consideration. And then uh, this committee will make a recommendation to the full council and the full council will have final approval. Um, we do budget every year $10,000 out of our occupancy tax fund, our hotel motel tax fund to, to fund the program, which is mainly for the purchase of the medallions and the labor to, to install them. In terms of the uh, criteria, um, to, to be eligible uh, for consideration, uh, an applicant has to be deceased. Uh, the applicant has to have been a resident of Winston-Salem for at least five years. Uh, the applicant has to have made a significant contribution to the arts and entertainment industry, and you can see the various disciplines there. And we also use the word iconic, that, that what they've done in, in their particular field is iconic uh, to the industry. Uh, they've exhibited a sus sustained excellence in their field over at least five years. 
And they've also made distinguished contributions to the community and uh, shown civic-oriented participation. So we did receive, um, I believe, eight, eight nominations uh, this year. Uh, Jim Austin in theater, Alice Bess in visual arts, Hal Binkley in theater, Ed Eaton in visual arts, Samuel Lilly in fort, and George Hamilton IV in music, uh, Sylvia Sprinkle Hamlin in theater, and Ann Shields in visual arts. So after reviewing the applications, the uh, ad hoc committee is presenting this slate of finalists. Next slide. Uh, Hal Binkley in uh, the area of category of theater, George Hamilton IV in the area of music, Sylvia Sprinkle Hamlin in theater, and Ann Shields in visual arts. And so I'm going to give a brief uh, kind of biography for, for each of the, the, uh, the finalists. So the, the first one here is Hal Binkley. Uh, who was an award-winning Broadway lighting designer. And you can see here his, his numerous awards. Uh, and I just wanted to highlight a couple. He, he was nominated for nine Tony Awards and received two for, uh, Hamilton, uh, excuse me, for Hamilton and Jersey Boys. And then received, was a two-time recipient of the Lawrence Olivier Award for Hamilton, again, and Kiss of the Spider Woman. Um, he's the co-founder and, and resident lighting designer for Parsons Dance. Uh, which is a New York City-based international touring modern dance company. The next uh, finalist is George Hamilton IV, who has the nickname of being the international ambassador of country music. He's also a 50-year, or was a 50-year, was a 50-year member of the Grand Ole Opry. Uh, you can see there are numerous awards, both Grammy and Country Music Association, as well as uh, induction into North Carolina. Uh, Hall of Fames. Uh, and then, interesting fact here, he was invited in 1974 by the State Department to go behind the curtain to lecture on the history of American country music and perform at Moscow University. Third uh, finalist is Sylvia uh, Sprinkle Hamlin. I think that, that was, uh, missed that little air there. But as you know, she was the chairwoman of the North Carolina Black Repertory Company. Uh, as well as the executive producer of the National Black Theater Festival. Um, she, in 2012, was selected to be interviewed by the History Makers, which is a nonprofit that tells and preserves stories of well-known uh, and unsung African Americans. And you know, beyond her service in the arts, uh, in 2000, she became the first African American and the first woman to head the Forsyth County Library System. Uh, and then the final uh, finalist here is Ann Kessler Shields. She's a founding member of the Associated Artist of Winston Salem. Later, it was uh, became known as Sika. Uh, a prolific artist and major force in forming the art scene in Winston Salem, and she has permanent collections there in various uh, venues: North Carolina Museum of Art, uh, Wake Forest Haynes Gallery, also outside of, of North Carolina. So. Those are the finalists for your consideration um, and recommendation to the full council. And the final slide, uh, we are planning to unveil uh, the medallions here prior to the start of the National Black Theater Festival on July 29th at uh, 10 a.m. at the Convention Center. Be happy to answer any questions. Any other questions or comments? Uh, thank you, Mr. Rao. Uh, for some of you, we have not done the unveiling of the stars. Uh, since 2019. So uh, it started and kicked off uh, the Friday before the National North Carolina Black Theater Festival. And we decided that we would do it that time going forward because it's all collective of these people, these honorees being a part of theater, the arts, and all of that. Uh, the families show up, friends show up. Uh, I'm hoping the council will come, those of you, you that have never done it, uh, to see the great support for this initiative that we began. The idea was we were going to, we were honoring, but when the five royals got inducted into the Hall of Fame, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, I suggested to staff, I mean, that's the five royals, that's our people, our folk here in Winston. And I said, we need to do something special that uh, places people iconic uh, so that when people visit the city or citizens here will be able to go look and learn something about these uh, tremendous people. Hence, uh, we directed the marketing department to create 
stars. And uh, I suggested that it goes to the convention center because we get a lot of traffic there from tourists. So again, I'd like to commend staff and everyone that worked on this project, uh, the council that voted for it. Uh, I look forward to uh, July 29th uh, at 10 a.m. Thank you so much. Could I have a motion? Move approval. Second. Is the moved and properly seconded? Would the city clerk please call the roll? Councilmember CPA. I'm sorry. I'm uh, still. My mind is on. <laughs> why we? Why, when was the last time we voted? 2019. <laughs> Today. <laughs> and it passes. Again, I, if you have never seen me in a meeting, I'm very, very relaxed and funny. I keep it light. Uh, next item, please. <laughs> Item C2, Resolution Amending Article 3 of the City of Winston-Salem Personnel Resolution regarding paid holidays for City of Winston-Salem employees. Councilmember Scipio. Yes, met, uh, Madam Chair. I only had a, a question. I think I figured out uh, my, my answer. But on page 2 of the resolution, um, <clears throat> In section B, uh, I was getting confused in the underlying part, which says when Christmas Eve is observed on a Friday and Christmas Day is observed on a Monday. I was having a problem with Christmas Eve and Monday, but now I understand that, I understand that, that the, the day for observing will be that Tuesday. So when the holiday falls on the weekend, our employees get that Christmas day off when it falls on the weekend on the preceding Yes, ma'am, but um, because these, these will be three consecutive holidays, if they are ever to be observed one, uh, ever to be observed one on Friday, one on Monday, uh, we push the other one to Tuesday. So if the day after Christmas is technically that Monday, instead of observing it that Monday, we would observe cri the uh, Christmas Day that Monday, and then the day after Christmas that Tuesday. Thank you so much. It was just so confusing until I read it about 10 times with the last one when I sat down. It was uh, the same when I wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> See, if you all have worked in manufacturing or somewhere, you know how that rolls. <laughs> I know how that one works. Of 38 and a half years, Christmas, Friday, Monday, you still get your day. Absolutely. Yeah. That's right. Simple as that. Absolutely. Any other comments or questions from the committee or council? Madam Chair, I, I move that we uh, approve C3. Second. It's the, oh, C2. C2. It has been moved and properly seconded. Would you please vote electronically? I got it right that time. <clears throat> Thank you. And the motion passes. Would the city clerk please call the next item? Item C3, resolution amending Article 2 of the City of Winston-Salem Personnel Resolution, authorizing the city manager to implement financial incentives for hard-to-fill positions. Dr. Barnett. Yes, ma'am. The here it is. So attached to this item are two policies that have been written. I previously came before this council and discussed a policy on uh, hard to fill roles offering a sign on incentive for new employees and also a referral incentive for um, for employees who are current city employees who are referring other employees for employment at the city of Winston-Salem if they were to be successful. On the referral incentive policy, what that policy does is it permits a up to a $1,000 payment for current city employees who uh, recommend other people who become successful in their plight for employment. That will be paid on a schedule. So after three months of that, uh, that employee's um, service with the city of Winston-Salem, that employee would get $500, followed by uh, two consecutive two payments of $250,000 after six months and then one year of service for a total of $1,000. The other item that's attached here gives the city manager authorization to 
um, to implement a sign-on incentive policy, net sign-on incentive policy for positions that pay up to $49,999.99. That is a $2,500 incentive uh, for new employees, and that will be paid in the first payroll following that employee signing on. For positions that pay more than $5,000, it would uh, be a $5,000 payment payable on the same schedule. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Council Member Scipio. Um, <clears throat> I know the policy states that. I just want to make it clear to everyone who's listening uh, and to fellow employees is that in order to receive the referral payment, the person you referred must stay employed at least one year. Yes, ma'am, that is correct. But there is a, an incentive after the first three months. Yes, ma'am. So in order to receive the full incentive amount payment, that person has to be employed for a full year. All right, I just wanted to make sure that was known by everybody. And then the, the other part that we'll make known for the public um, is that this policy, it does uh, allow for the city manager to terminate this policy at any time. Once we have gotten to w away from those critical staffing levels where we are now, it gives the city manager, of course, the authority to end the policy at any time. Councilmember Monday. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, I'm assuming, and correct me if I'm wrong, that there's a mechanism in place that the uh, the new employee can only name one person. Who? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, our um, our employment application. There is a, a box on there where you can check how are you referred by a city employee, um, and you actually bring up a very valid question. And so, what I'll instruct my staff to do in terms of the process, if multiple employees are listed, we will go with the first named employee as the referring source. That makes me feel good <laughs> that you. we have a a, a stopgap there. Um, and then a, an additional question: hard to fill. Is is that a changing definition? who makes the, the call on what is considered a hard to fill position. So that's a decision that will be made primarily by the city manager's office with the assistance of human resources. As we look at those positions, some of the considerations that will go into that determination are the number of days vacant, the types of skills required for those positions. So um, just throwing out a couple, um, the city right now, I think we have four open neighborhood conservation officers. And as you all know, the, the work that they do is extremely important in terms of the upkeep of our neighborhoods and the overall look of our community with that number of vacancies and how long those positions have been vacant, those are positions that would, I'm fairly confident saying, would be uh, noted as being hard to fill positions. So there's an objective measurement, again, yes, instead of subjective, and that's yes, good, thank you. Council Member Larson. That answered my question, thank you. Um, <laughs> I know, again, I know we have to get creative, I love it, I've said that, a couple of weeks ago or last month when you brought this for information. Um, the first one, the first policy. Yes, ma'am. The one that gives the $500 after three months, 250, six months, 250 a year, after a year. I, I don't know whether I'm comfortable with the three months. Okay. Uh, because most of the time when you work, you're on six-month probation, sometimes before you even get insurance or anything like that. And uh, I'm just wondering, and I know you, you and staff have thought this through, the city manager and everyone, but one, what other cities are doing something similar to this that you talk to? I know you. You talk to somebody. Yes, ma'am. Um, so in terms of building out this requirement, what we were looking at is, and as we talked to our contemporaries, they were saying people need kind of that immediate incentive to do it. People are not driven by something that they'll get in 12 months. And so instead of giving it all up front, we decided, well, let's give a piece here and then give other you know, monies for those benchmark dates later. Um, so in terms of people that we talked to, we did benchmark with the 10 largest municipalities, or technically 
other nine largest municipalities. I cannot say with any reasonable degree of certainty right this second which municipality is doing which structure, but I'd be happy to bring that back to the committee and, and provide that breakout to say, you know, whose looks like what. And the it's built in that you will report as to how this program is running? Yes, ma'am. Again, I, <laughs> I understand the, the carrot. I got it. But three months. And also, Dr. Barnett, would you also include the cost? Break, give me some examples of the most hardest jobs and the cost of that, as well as this cost with benefits and everything else. Uh, so we can kind of get a clear idea of that as well. Uh, the, the program is written when we brought it before. It was for up to a maximum of $100,000 a year. And between the city manager's office and the office of um, the, the budget and performance management office, we decided we'd cap it there and we'd be able to use salary savings in order to fund the program. Very good. And this will go in effect when? Uh, whenever it is duly adopted by this body. So if it's approved at next Monday's council meeting, then it will go into effect immediately for um, any postings that come after that. I would suggest or would ask that we get updates uh, as to how it's going, whether it's two months or whatever, uh, with numbers and totals and what jobs uh, that we were able to fill. Councilman Scipio. Dr. Barnett, under exclusions B, can you explain that? Uh, let's see. Under the referral policy. Any city employee who, oh, under the referral, is this the? Yeah, I think this yeah, is the referral, referral okay. policy. Any city employee who, in the regular course of their duties, refers an applicant for employment who's successful is not eligible. So, for example, myself, or certain members of my staff, as great as they are at doing their jobs, they would not be eligible for an incentive if they say met a candidate at a job fair. And, you know, and then that person said, oh, well, you know, I met a recruiter at a job fair. Um, so that's in here specifically for if in the course of their duties they were to meet someone um, or, you know, say someone else in the official course of their duties met someone who decided to, to fill out an application for employment. Okay, thank you. May I have Madam, a motion? Med, oh, Mr. Larson. Councilmember Member Larson. Yes, uh, Dr. Burnett, as I, as I recall, oh there was a provision, a clawback, if they don't meet the requirements. Yes, sir. Can you explain the, cl the clawback part of this? Yes, sir. So um, for any candidate who <clears throat> um, receives a payment under this policy, or rather any new employee who receives a payment under this policy and does not make it to certain benchmarks, we would be able to essentially get those funds back out of their final paycheck, um, any amount that, that was being forfeited under the policy. Right. Madam Chair, I move for approval of C-3. C-3. May I have a second? Second. So moved and properly seconded. Please prepare for the vote. Thank you. The resolution passes. We will now move to the general agenda. And would the city clerk please call the first item. Item G1, resolution suspending the city of Winston-Salem COVID-19 vaccination incentives and testing policy. Mr. Rao. Good afternoon again, Chairwoman Adams, members of the City Council. Excuse me, Mr. Rao, we're having trouble I'm sorry. hearing you. There we go. How's that? That's okay, good. Thank you. Um, so last month, I provided an update on the city's COVID-19 vaccination incentives and testing policy, and you all had a number of questions and requests for information. Um, and so I'm going to go over those responses here initially and then present to you a, a resolution to suspend the policy based on the most recent data that we have. So second slide, so just to recap, we have been tracking a number of metrics to, uh, to measure uh, the effectiveness of the policy 
And you can see there in the table that right now we have, you know, 1,944 vaccinated employees. That amounts to 86% of the city workforce. We've paid out $1.8 million in full and partial vaccination incentives. Uh, we've also paid out uh, booster incentives to 612 employees. Uh, we have three, over 300 employees who are unvaccinated who are submitting to the weekly testing requirement. Uh, of that number, uh, we have seen 81 uh, test positive for COVID-19, and then we've had over 30 uh, that have resulted in disciplinary action for non-compliance. Next slide just shows the relationship there between the vaccination rate here going back to last fall and the number of uh, unvaccinated employees. So uh, just to go over some responses to questions, one of the questions that had been asked you know, last month was, well, how many uh, vaccinated city employees uh, have tested positive? And you know, when we implemented the policy, our measuring was focused on the unvaccinated employees and tracking uh, you know, results from those, from those tests. And so we have not been tracking the test results of our vaccinated workforce. And honestly, we feel like if we tried to somehow do some cross-referencing between the list and what's been reported to employee medical, that it probably would not be a, a number we would feel is reliable. And so, uh, so that's not included in the, uh, the, the council action that you have before you. Uh, also, a number, another question that was asked was, what was the distribution of uh, unvaccinated employees across the city organization? And again, that is, that is information that, that we've been very careful about, that if that information uh, is provided, then it could be a potential violation of HIPAA because one could see with a certain size office that if 100% of the employees were vaccinated, they probably would know who those employees were. And so uh, we've not provided that information. So just wanted to share that uh, at this point. Next slide. Um, so just kind of where we are in terms of our, our current metrics. Um, as of March 22nd, so the end of March, the 14-day positivity rate in Forsyth County had dropped from 4% to 2.5%. Um, the number of cases per 100,000 residents over the last 14 days has dropped from 74 in late March to 62 in early April. And then uh, per the health department, our vaccination rate among all ages in Forsyth County currently is at 62% for adults 18 and over, uh, the vaccination rate is 72%. Another uh, request from this committee was, well, where's the, what is the status of the vaccination policies and testing policies of the other large cities in the state? And we looked at, we tried to get information from the, from the 10 largest, uh, next slide. And you can see there that basically, you know, the column labeled mandatory testing that half the cities have uh, ceased mandatory testing. Um, you can also see there that the vaccination incentives, those who have had vaccination incentives in place and their, and their rates. So we are towards the, the upper end in terms of uh, the effectiveness of our policy and then where they are with the masking requirements. So right now, looking at the, the top 10 largest cities, about half have ceased testing. Um, next slide. One last request from this, from this committee was uh, for staff to reach out to our local infectious disease experts to get uh, some insights from them about you know, where we are and, and how we might want to proceed, uh, particularly with mandatory testing. Uh, I did reach out to David Priest, Dr. David Priest, who's the Senior Vice President and Chief Safety Quality and Epidemiology Officer with Novant Health. And what he shared uh, you know, with me was that uh, you know, while it's recognized that you know, for, unvac for vaccinated and uh, those who have contracted COVID-19, that the length of the immunity uh, is, is still unknown really how, how long it may last that there is protection there and uh, and after he saw the number of employees that we had who are unvaccinated 301 and the assumption that probably a lot of those who uh, have probably you know gotten COVID-19 that he stated that he was in favor of no longer testing these individuals and he said that is in line with current CDC guidelines regarding low uh, test I mean excuse me low COVID activity 
uh, and, and I just showed you the, uh, the the metrics there. But he did say he did say that that, that we still needed to be nimble as an organization to be able to implement you know, the measures that we have you know, had in place for a good number of months. Uh, when the community experiences increases uh, in cases in the coming weeks. So he, he, he stated that he was not in favor of that, you know, of us continuing to test, but we did need to be prepared to be able to react if we did see an uptick in cases. So with that uh, in mind, uh, city management is presenting a resolution to you all today to suspend the, the city's COVID-19 uh, vaccination incentives and testing policy. And here are the provisions there. Sandra, if you'd pull that last slide up. I don't know what you said because you turned your head away from the mic. Oh, I'm sorry. So I, <laughs> just, I was asking uh, Sandra if she would pull that last slide up. So, um, so to go over the, the, the main elements here of this resolution, um, first, mandatory testing for unvaccinated employees would cease upon adoption of the resolution. So if this committee recommends approval uh, and full council approves it next Monday, the 18th, that, uh, that testing would cease as of then. Um, the city would also suspend the requirement that all new hires must be fully vaccinated. So this would, this would apply to uh, candidates, I should have said, or applicants that were hired after the adoption of this resolution. And, and way, the way we intend to implement that basically is if an applicant's in the pipeline right now and you all uh, approve this resolution, then they would not have to be fully vaccinated as a condition of, of employment. Um, the vaccination financial incentives would no longer be available after uh, April 25th. So when the policy goes into effect, if the policy goes into effect on the 18th, we'd give employees another week to uh, demonstrate proof of full vaccination or to pr or, or proof of a booster incentive, booster vaccination to receive those financial incentives. And then all other provisions um, of the policy would be suspended upon adoption of the resolution. And I want to emphasize that what we are presenting is a suspension of the policy, not a sunset of the policy. And in and, and the last bullet, and based on the insights provided by Dr. Priest, the resolution also states that, that, that the mayor and the council have the authority to reinstate the provisions of the policy as needed to ensure a safe workplace if a new variance you know, cause an increase in, in positivity rate, cases, and, and the other metrics that we're looking at uh, that indicate a resurgence in COVID-19. So we want to make sure that we're still nimble, uh, as, as Dr. Priest said, and that we can react if we see an uptick in cases. But what we are presenting today is a resolution to suspend the, the, the policy. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any comments or questions? Councilmember on Monday. Thank you. Um, I, I think it depends on who you ask uh, as to whether or not we can track who uh, has had vaccinations and not with respect to HIPAA. But um, reading that this will no longer be a requirement for new hires, will we ask if they're vaccinated so that we can continue to accurately track our metrics? That, Council Member Monday, I'm not, uh, honestly, I'm not sure about um, because it won't be a requirement, you know, a condition of employment. So, uh, so that, that is probably a detail of the, of the implementation of this suspension that we'd have to work through. And this is so nitpicky, but in the final point, <clears throat> if new variants cause increases, we could very well have a resurgence of a variant that we've already been through. So I think to say, to, to exclude that to, um, or to only include new variants could potentially um, be limiting. I don't think we would. I, th I know the intent of the, the, um, the bullet point, but um, I would say if any variant causes uh, an increase again. Yes, sir. And you're correct. That is the intent. If there is a resurgence of cases. Council Thank you. Member Scipio. When we went into this, um, we really didn't know what to expect. Um, and now that we've done it and we've seen the numbers, um, on one hand, I would say 80, 86% of our employees have been vaccinated. 
in many ways that's good. Um, but I guess my viewpoint would have been that more, more than that would have been vaccinated. But given the program and what we put into place, it looks like it was successful. Um, my real question has to do with the term suspended. Um, are we using that as a legal term so that we don't have to resurrect doing it all over again if there's a resurgence so we can activate it if it's been suspended? Is, is that the real reason we're using that term? Yes, that's correct. Okay, great. Um, we certainly hope we don't have to have another uh, variant, uh, but how quickly could we activate it if a variant came in and it started increasing again. I would think we'd want to at least bring it um, through this committee and back to council. So I would say within maybe two weeks, depending upon, hopefully it's not in Ju um, July when you're not meeting, but at a month when you're meeting, maybe two weeks. Okay. Uh, I do have a concern about not requiring vaccination for new hires, but that's that's a personal concern on my part. I think. We have to fill those positions. I hate for vaccination to stand in the way of having a good employee. Um, can I have a motion and then uh, we can continue discussion? If Madam Chair, I'll move approval of, of G1. Second. It's been moved and properly seconded. Um, I'd like to make a comment again. Uh, I commend staff and everything that all of you had to do, did, and still doing uh, to keep our employees safe and to keep our citizens safe. Uh, I think like everyone else in the country, we have to move on at some point. Uh, hopefully that we won't see a lot of uh, sickness and other things that cause uh, issues, but we have to be diligent. Uh, I think Mr. Garrity, Mr. Rao, Ms. Dr. Barnett, I think it's imperative that we continue to send out uh, messages to our employees and staff of if it's only just a message of the day, you might want to get the text message number that just to remind people, today is so-and-so, be safe, wear a mask if you please, but always think just to be safe, to go home to your families and towards the citizens of Winston-Salem. Uh, I am very glad that the council, we are moving on and moving forward. Um, the thing that I do wonder about, though, again, are those numbers that I asked for that were apples to oranges, and I wanted apples to apples. Um, if we know that we had so many employees that were not being tested, and then we have all of these people that were tested, and we, we know probably the people that weren't unvaccinated when they got the virus. And I know, we know, basically, when these, this other group got the virus. We're not asking for names. We're not asking for uh, departments. We're just asking for numbers. And Dr. Barnett, uh, I hope you're going to figure that out for, for me, because there is just something missing right now that we did what we did and we, the council has no way of knowing that I had over 1,600 people vaccinated and 30% or 40% came down with this virus. I know that may not be information that people want to share, but I think it's important for the people who decided and made that choice not to be vaccinated to know that we're being transparent with both sides. Do you all, Mr. Garrett, understand what I'm saying? We were quick to give up the information on the people that weren't vaccinated, and we kind of put this other group, the rest of us, over here. And I think we need to be transparent to both and treat both sides equally. Again, we're not asking for, for confidential information, departments, staff, age, we're not asking for none of that. We just need numbers just like we do when we benchmark other cities and, and initiatives, okay? Yes, ma'am. With that, uh, with the committee, any other discussion? Please vote. And the resolution passes. Thank you so much. Would the city clerk please read the next item? Item G2, information on social districts. <clears throat> Mr. King. 
Good afternoon, Mayor Pro Tem Adams and council members. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about um, social districts this afternoon. So in September of 2021, the General Assembly approved House Bill 890, and that in entailed various changes to ABC laws, and included with that was the uh, authority for cities and counties to establish social districts. And so at a high level, um, think of a social district as an area that's been approved within a city, probably a downtown, where you can um, get an open container of maybe a beer to go, you can walk out on the public sidewalk, and you can go within the boundaries of an approved social district with that open container in your hand. Um, at a high level, that's really what the social district is. Uh, HB 890, it basically sets forth and allows local governments to establish the boundaries of a social district, the hours of operation. It also includes other measures that have to be adhered to in terms of the types of containers, information that has to be on there, and which businesses you can go in and, in and out of with respect to that. Um, <clears throat> Since uh, HB 890 was approved, several North Carolina cities have, have created social districts, and probably the one that's most notable is Greensboro. They uh, created theirs in December of 2021, and it became effective on March 1st of this year, so it's been in effect for uh, a month and a half, give or take. High Point recently created a, a social district within the, probably the past two weeks, and other cities uh, that have done so have been Hickory, Newton, Kannapolis, Lake Norman. What I would tell you in, in researching and benchmarking some of the larger cities is your Charlotte's, Raleigh's, Durham's appear to be taking a little slower tack with this and wading into this um, a little bit more carefully if, if I'm reading the tea leaves correctly from what I've, what I've researched. Um, as you saw in your, in your uh, information materials in your packet, just some consideration should Winston-Salem want to create a social district. And I think at the top of that list, the, the issue of public safety is, is paramount. Um, we already know our police department has uh, vacancies within and they're already stressed. We are we obviously already know the conversation around police. Downtown is one that's familiar in our community. So I would tell you that's probably at the top of the list. The administration of a social district, who's gonna implement it, the cost associated with it, who's gonna educate the public, I think is another consideration that warrants some discussion. Probably the other large thing is, is the boundaries of a social district. Do you create one large district for your downtown area, or do you consider maybe multiple smaller um, social districts within a downtown? And I think the last piece is really just input and, and, and engaging the support for this from our downtown stakeholders to, to kind of take the temperature on whether folks want this and what the sentiment is and any input that, that stakeholders would have into the process. So, so at a high level, that is um, a really quick overview of, of social districts. We wanted to get this before the committee to see what level of interest there was in pursuing this. Um, with us today, we do have representatives from WSPD. We've got Assistant Chief Weaver and Captain Noonan, and we've also got Jason Thiel here from the Downtown Winston-Salem Partnership, should you have any questions for them. And I'm glad to answer any questions at this time. Thank you, Mr. King. Uh, committee, uh, I do want you all to understand uh, we have 45 minutes. We have these young people here, uh, Human Relations, our uh, College Advisory Board, and we also have the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Survey. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I mean, I'm, I'm going to make a suggestion. City Attorney, let me know. I think this warrants more conversation. I think because it's information that, Mr. King, you bring it back to committee again, but also reach out to all of the council members to get their points of view. Uh, you've heard the, the main bullet points of this initiative. Uh, we have an entertainment district. We have a public safety shortage. So uh, I would just ask the committee to think about that. Can we do that? Do I need a motion to do that? It would be good to have one, if you don't mind. I do have a quick comment. I think Council we, got, member, we got plenty of time. Clark. We got 45 minutes. We only got two items left. They're trying to cut my young people short. I want you to know I don't feel that way. Go ahead, Councilmember Member Clark. Just, Mr. Thiel's here. Uh, I look to your organization for your thoughts, and I don't need them today or tomorrow. I right. think, as Mr. King said, we may want to wait and see what happens in Greensboro and other places. Uh, I have been to, to New Orleans where they have open container everywhere, and at times it is absolutely deplorable. 
Mm -hmm. I've seen people throw up on the street, yeah. pass out on the street, uh, other things of that sort. But at the same time, it's nice you can carry the beer from one place to the next. But, but I think we got a, a great organization place that can give us some feedback at the appropriate time. And I'll make a motion that we hold this in committee. If you Thank you. That. May I have a second? Second. This has been moved and probably seconded. Uh, City Clerk. Can I ask a question, Madam Chair, down here? Is there a particular time frame within which you would like for us to bring it back to committee? Bring it back to committee next month. Okay, I just wanna make sure. And then we can have more discussion. Uh, they will have talked to all of the council members and they can provide some further information, okay? okay? Council Member Larson. Will this require a public hearing? I'll double check. My recollection is it doesn't, but I'll double Probably. check. Probably. <laughs> City of, uh, Attorney Carmen, when we did the entertainment district, didn't we do a public hearing for that? I think we did. Is that in the UDL? I'm trying to remember. We did because we it's did. a UDL amendment and it requires one. It's like zoning and affecting people's lives. Because everyone voted on the committee. Thank you. It passes three to one. Next item, please. Item G3, 2021-2022 College Advisory Board Annual Report. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Um, Chairperson Adams and committee members, members of the city council, our, our esteemed city manager and assistant city managers. We're happy to be here this evening um, and I am flanked by two members of our college advisory board and they are really excited to share the information that they have from CAB this year as we call them. And Sid is going to be our very first speaker and he chaired the college advisory board this year. And then he will be joined also by Kelly Joe. And Sid is from Wake Forest, Kelly Joe is from Salem College. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to take the opportunity once again to say good evening, uh, Mayor Pro Temp Adams, as well as members of council. Uh, I'd just like to um, focus on our um, primary results for the, for the National League of Cities. We have made a lot of progress so far in our grant, which is going to be spanning into the 2022-2023 year as well in terms of just getting results and getting data on the demographics for the, um, the hunger and housing needs of post-secondary students in, in Winston-Salem. So we have gotten the results back from a survey launched at Winston-Salem State University, um, surveying 180 students. So I'd like to take the opportunity to go over some of those key findings that we have. So we found that um, um, many of the students in winston Samson State University were experiencing challenges with regard to just hunger and housing as well. And those, those challenges were primarily related to income, not necessarily transportation, but they were really centered around income rather than family issues or, or other transportational barriers. And what's really remarkable is that over a third of people knew somebody who had experienced hunger and housing insecurity. So there's definitely a need that needs to be addressed in the community. And we also additionally found an overall lack of comfort when it came to kind of reaching out to the free resources available in the community. So the students, even though they had some awareness of the resources available, they just did not feel as comfortable with, with really putting themselves out there and, and reaching out. So again, we are, uh, in, in terms of the uh, IRB process and the results at Wake Forest, we are looking forward to continuing on with this survey into the next uh, semester, into the fall, getting results back from Wake Forest University, and we really hope that this information will be helpful for the city council in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I am thrilled that you called me one of these young people. You just made my day. <laughs> That's right. I am a full-time student. Um, I'm speaking about the newsletters. We have copies of the newsletters. They'll be in your packet of information that you'll um, receive at the end of the week. Um, we had some challenges this year as we met to go back on campus. Some of the events that we typically attend were not available to us, um, but we made... we managed. Um, for me, this was a great opportunity, and I see this continuing to be a great opportunity for our young college students. Um, I plan to go back and get engaged in how we get younger people and more class participation um, so that it doesn't end up being a Sid and I again next year. 
um, so that we have more involvement. I think this is a wonderful opportunity for us to see how the city government works and to be a part of that city government. So I want to thank you for that opportunity. It's been very enlightening to me. And we want to continue this process into the next school year. We want to get more students engaged and get the activities going again as we begin to get to that more normal side of the needle um, so that we can continue this process and this program. I think it's a very valid program. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to take the moment to ask you if there's any questions from any members of council or Mayor Pro Temp Adams. Um, I would like to thank you all for everything you're doing. And I don't know whether you or Dr. Abraha can give a uh, small informational uh, points on uh, the National League of Cities grant that we received and how we competed. <laughs> yes, ma'am. And so of uh, the National League of Cities grant was actually a competitive process. And so we were one of 13 cities selected to participate in the grant. And what the grant is um, focused on is making sure that any barriers that are present in local communities are addressed or removed through collaboration and partnerships between municipalities and post-secondary institutions. And so when we prepared the proposal for the NLC for this grant, we recommended that our lead post-secondary institution be Winston-Salem State University, given, given that they are our local HBCU. And we do know that hunger and housing disproportionately impact minority students. And so when we wrote that up, we also included the fact that we have a college advisory board and that WSSU is represented on that board as well as all of our major um, colleges and universities here in Winston-Salem. And so that was um, why we were selected primarily is because of CAB's involvement and because of course we do have a local HBCU. And so we are working with the NLC for um, three years on this particular grant to uh, make sure that we are coming up with innovative ways to partner, we being the municipality, of course, partnering with WSSU on trying to come up with some creative strategies for addressing housing and hunger as they affect and impact college students. And so with hunger, that's one of the reasons, and housing, that's one of the reasons CAB came up with the survey. They, they said, well, how can we really have a meaningful, tangible impact if we don't know what the barriers are? They did not want to make the assumption that they knew it all just because that happens to be their representative age group. And so we all agreed with that. And so they worked really hard um, to come up with the survey questions and to pose those questions. And of course, we found out through the course of that that we couldn't just go on campuses and give out surveys. There's a process, and there's something called an IRB process, and Sid mentioned that earlier. And so each college has an IRB process, and I think it's a statewide recommended type of process, but anyway, each college has little nuances of that process or iterations of it. And so Winston-Salem State did indeed um, have their complete IRB first before anyone else. And so they were able to go ahead and launch their survey on their campus. And Wake Forest is coming in a close second, so they will probably launch theirs, if not this semester, then in the fall. And so, so some of the things that we're looking at are things like for hunger, for instance, working with the farmer's market here locally and making sure that students have access to fresh food and affordable food whenever they need it. Because oftentimes, particularly during the pandemic, a lot of students lost their sources of income, whether the source might have been through parents or their own, maybe they were working. But with the pandemic and the lockdown and so on, a lot of people didn't have any income whatsoever. So that meant they didn't have food access like they normally did. And so we think that by working with the farmer's market, that would be an easy way for students to be able to access food, particularly if their campuses will help them to get there, if they could provide transportation or maybe even work with food plans that they currently have so that it could be applied to the farmer's market's goods. And so that's just one example on the hunger side. On the housing side, um, we have been working with Winston-Salem State to identify, hopefully, some um, some uh, multi-housing options here in the city so that perhaps there could be some affordable rents 
that are just set aside for college students, particularly our HBCU college students who reside or need to reside off campus. And so that is still a work in progress. And of course, it's a partnership. And so it will be one of those things where WSSU would need to lean on the city to try to maybe help open some of those doors. And so those are just a couple of examples. We do have a blueprint with all of the examples and all of the different things, the action items that we're undertaking, but those are two um, of those examples right there. So that in a nutshell is the grant. Thank you. You're One welcome. of the things that I would like to see uh, your department and the CAB uh, marketing, uh, we gotta help get the word out about this uh, advisory board. And the only way we can do that is we got to use the members presently to put together what they think would be the marketing you know, uh, process for us to get more people from the campuses involved. Again, COVID was a game changer for everybody, uh, particularly for my young people. So if we, if you could, that's a suggestion. Yes. Uh, I would really like for you to get the city manager with uh, Mr. McNeil and his department and the, the members of the board that you guys come up with some ideas of what you think is needed to get the word out and to get more participation. Because if you are an extension of the city, then it's our responsibility because we created you to help you. So we can do that. Can we not, Dr. Abra? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Councilmember Monday, and then Councilmember Larson. Dr. Abraha, it's very nice to see you in person. It is awesome <laughs> to see you too. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at page four where you've got the makeup of the college advisory board. Um, and I see uh, two representatives from Winston-Salem State, three from Wake Forest, and just one from the others. Is, is, is the membership weighted on the population of the university in any way? Or is, is there a rhyme and reason for having more of some uh, colleges than others? No, sir. We seek to have three representatives from each college or university. And so this just happens to be the representation for this year. Okay. And then a follow-up question to that is, it, would it be appropriate to um, include Piedmont International College or University? Um, I know it's not a new organization. I think their, their name is new. And, uh, their name are, is new. They're in the community, I think, more under their new identity than they were in the past. Right. And we reach out to them each year. And what they've told us is that they were kind of in a flux. And so they wanted to get stabilized first. And then they would um, work on having representation on GAB. But we've reached out to them every year. Good. OK. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Councilmember Larson. That, that, was, that was my question, representing the South Ward, Carolina University, making sure that they're at the table. Yes. Hopefully, hopefully this upcoming um, school year, they will send us some representatives. All right. Thank you all so much again for all your work. And uh, we are continuing to support you. And we want this to be uh, a big success like it was when it first started. And I think also, Dr. Abraha, the reason why we were so successful back in 2010 and coming forward was we had a council member who was only 20 years old. So he had just come out of college and this was his brainchild. And uh, he did a tremendous job of going to the campuses all over the city, uh, meeting with his peers and everyone. So Nick, we just got to get the train rolling, that's all, okay? Thank you all so much. Have a great night and be safe. And that was for information. Uh, next item, please, City Clerk. Item G4, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Employee Equity Sur Survey Overview. And once again, good evening, everyone. Um, I would like to introduce to you, I have the pleasure of introducing to you Ms. Brittany Pitts. Brittany is one of our newer employees. Uh, I think she's been on staff now for approximately seven months. Uh, she is actually a graduate of North Carolina Central University School of Law. And I'm very happy to have her on board. <laughs> oh, did you? That, you weren't supposed to see that. <laughs> but um, I'm really excited to have her on board. Um, her law degree has certainly been put to very good use. And um, she has been charged with leading our equity, um, employee equity survey 
and trying to um, synthesize the results and analyze what this means and, and what it is that we um, need to do to address some of the issues that were brought up during the survey. So without further ado, Ms. Brittany Pitts. Welcome. Good evening, Mayor Pro Tem Adams, as well as the members of City Council. I am Brittany Pitts, as Dr. Alan Abraham just stated, and I'm the Equity Assurance Administrator for the Human Relations, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Department. My primary focus is DEI, and I work alongside Mr. Shane Taylor, who is our Equity and Inclusion Coordinator. He's here today as well. Um, in addition to Ms. Myra Ramirez, who is our DEI Administrative Assistant. Today, I will be speaking to you all um, briefly on the highlights of our recently launched employee equity survey. Um, this survey was created by the DEI division with the assistance of the equity core team. The purpose was, you know, just to gauge the climate of the perceptions within the city as it relates to diversity, equity, and inclusion within the city of Winston-Salem. It was launched on February 11th of 2022, and it closed on March 11th. So it was available to city employees for an entire month. We received 374 total entry. So this is just shy of 20% of our workforce. As it relates to the survey design, we had a total of five survey questions, and two of those questions were open-ended questions. Um, today, I will not be reviewing the two open-ended questions. However, we have gathered those responses, and there were a total of about 446 combined responses to the open-ended questions. And again, this survey was completely voluntary and it was anonymous, just wanted to put that out there. So as you can see on the um, survey overview, the first question was a scaled question, and it had the following statements, and it asked employees to rate um, strongly disagree or strongly agree to the following statements. And based off of the responses that we received, um, overall respondents strongly disagreed with the following statement, and that was that promotional opportunities and vacancies are made available in a fair and inclusive manner. Um, so that was something that really, really stood out amongst employees and their responses. They um, strongly disagree with that statement. However, if you take the time to review the different statements and the skill responses, you will see that there are some strongly agreed statements. So we don't want to ponder on you know, the negativity because there are a lot of great things about the city of Winston-Salem as well, such as women are respected within the organization equally as men. Um, and we see that the strongly agree was way much larger than the strongly disagree. Um, but as far as the promotional opportunities, I just think that this is a great opportunity to um, just identify ways for transparency as it relates to our promotions and vacancies. So if we proceed to the next question, which is question number two, um, this just addressed what DEI concerns that um, an individual or an employee may have personally, and that is on the next page. And so most respondents agreed that employee retention, um, that was the number one DEI concern for the city of Winston-Salem. And again, this is just roughly almost 20% of our workforce. And so most respondents agreed that um, employee retention was the number one concern. And of course, trailing nets, as you will see, is professional development and pay inequities. Um, when I review this data, I see that, you know, sometimes those other issues or concerns, it can heavily play a role or a part of professional development. So as of employee retention, I'm sorry. So if there are, you know, inadequate professional development opportunities or if employees are filled as if they're underpaid, this would, you know, have employees considering ending employment with the city of Winston-Salem. And so it could play a part um, in addressing those em employee retention concerns. In addition to hiring practices, those were our top four shared concerns amongst the employees who took the time to complete this survey. And so although these concerns were selected more frequently than others, we just want to pay attention to the other concerns as well because they're also worth 
reviewing, such as um, employee engagement or racial equality, et cetera. So ultimately, I feel as if all of these concerns should be very much so addressed when trying to resolve and evaluate employee retention, as I feel that we are um, we're doing that now. And so if we want to proceed to the next page, which is question number four, this pie chart here, um, this question states, have you experienced any unwelcome comments or conduct at the city of Winston-Salem that you felt were offensive, embarrassing, or hurtful? So I um, just wanted to point out that out of 368 respondents um, in total, there were a total of there were a total of 368 out of 374 total responses to this question. So that means that only six employees chose not to respond to this question, only six. So we did have a great response rate as it relates to this number, this question. And so out of those 374 responses, um, we 50% selected no. They have not experienced any unwelcome comments or anything that they felt was offensive or embarrassing. I will say that that is that's great. That's good. 50% selected no. However, we still had a large amount, 40% who selected um, yes. And that is a huge concern. And so um, it's equally important that we had some selections for maybe. And so I believe that was about roughly 10% who selected maybe. And that could just be um, just not, you know, not knowing if it's defined or classified as being unwelcoming or offensive or embarrassing. So we could maybe um, consider those as yeses too, but what have you, the numbers are still about 40% who selected that, yeah, they have experienced unwelcome comments and um, or conduct that they thought was hurtful or offensive, and we should definitely, definitely um, want to address that. So just to wrap things up and summarize for you. The top most co um, shared concerns amongst employees who completed this survey, as you can see in the summary, were employee retention um, for number one. Number two was the promotion and hiring practices. And then number three was pay and equities slash professional development. And so at this time, that concludes the overview um, of this employee equity survey overview. And I am open to taking any questions that I have that you have. Sorry. Councilmember Clark. Uh, two questions slash comments. Yes. Of the 374 individuals that uh, completed the survey, do you have any demographic data on them to know if it was a random so we do not have any demographical data at all. We didn't ask for um, names, information, contact departments, oh. no demographics at all. Um, literally, we just have numbers that are associated with responses, but they're not. we're not able to pinpoint who exactly said what. It was completely anonymous. Okay. Yeah. Um, I would be careful to draw broad conclusions then from a sample of 20% that was... Not random, but but anyway, better than nothing. Because I think this is the first year we've done something like this. Mm -hmm. okay. The other question area is employee retention. Mm -hmm. It would be interesting to look at the folks that have left to see if there's any demographic trend there. Age, maybe what level they are in the company, sex, race, all that type stuff, just to see... To me, retention in in the end is, is is a good indicator. Are you a good employer? If everyone's leaving, then yeah. you know if all the rats are leaving, <laughs> you, you got a problem somewhere on the ship. Uh, but of course, in today's environment, everyone's experiencing a lot of a lot of uh, retention issues, uh, and that gets back to the whole COVID thing, which we won't go into. But if we could. Maybe you don't need to get it next week, but get some data on the the folks that have left. Uh, that would be helpful. Okay, thank you. Will do. Thank you, ma'am. Very good. No worries. I uh, the number of people that participated in the survey again. Uh, we have a branding issue and an issue as the city that we can't even get our own employees to participate in an anonymous survey. Nevertheless, our citizens. I think that's one directive, uh, Dr. Abraha, Ms. Pitts, that we need to go work on. Again, find out what other cities are doing. Ask people what would make you just random 
answer a survey. If I'm giving you a $5 gift card or something, just like with the COVID, we need to have some data. And right now, we don't know where we stand. We don't know where we stand with our citizens because they don't answer enough, and we don't know where we stand with our employees. Uh, I think there needs to be more follow-up to this because how can you tout, again, that everybody touts diversity, equity, and inclusion when you're not being intentional enough to figure out what it is that we need to be doing in order for people to feel like they matter at their job, you know, that they don't want to leave. This is a great place. And yet, we know that it's because of training and professional development. That's huge. If you're training A, and I know I'm a better employee than A, and I'm B, and you decide you like them better than me, then I'm, I'm going to give, throw my hands up in the air and I'm out. And I have done that before. <laughs> Research as to how we, with our promotional hirings, what would give, again, our employees the perception, and perception is everything, that you're not giving me an opportunity to be promoted. Maybe I don't know what training I need. Dr. Dr. Barnett, he's gone. What training I need. I worked for a company that they had to revamp their whole HR training process because they weren't training enough people to do the job, but yet we had droves of people leaving that had been with the company for 30 plus years. And that's the same situation we have right now. Best practices or practices on how we follow up to allow our employees to know that this was just not a checkbox that we put out there that we took a survey of our employees and they told us X. If you never follow up on an action, then to the person, again, perception is it was really never an action. It's just an, an inaction checking a box. Are there any more? Council Member Larson. Yes, we, we just talked about uh, recruiting and, and something dealing with incentives for hiring. Was there, was there not a, a discussion at one point about retention bonuses of some sort? We, we look at that as, a, as, a, as an option for the issue of retention, as a economic incentives on retention after five, ten years, whatever. Council, Council Member, uh, good evening, Member Tim Adams, members of the committee. Councilmember Larson, uh, there's been some requests for retention incentives or longevity. Um, that hasn't been it hasn't hasn't risen to the level that is, is our highest priority for funding. Um, this survey points out some really significant issues. Uh, professional development is an area that we have cut over the last ten years. We are significantly uh, behind our average spending per employee for training and development. Is something that uh, Scott Tess and I've been talking about that we need to beef up for employees. It's an important thing for all employees to have that access to to training to, to get promoted, to get um, move ahead. Um, we also had some, some, some as Councilor Clark pointed out, that this is a, a difficult time as far as the economy, but we also had some people in the survey upset about being discriminated because we made them get tested for not being vaccinated as well. Okay. okay. Mayor Pro Tem, if I may, um, we are working currently with an equity core team, which is a representation of employees from each city department who um, helped to design the questions that were in the survey. And so they also will be a resource for helping us to understand, okay, what do we need to do to move forward? What kinds of things should we be taking into consideration? And so forth. And also we're forming employee resource groups so that they can have more or less affinity groups, um, groups that can come together and maybe help to support each other, whether they are Hispa Hispanic Latino, maybe they are um, new to North Carolina and they wanna have a group, uh, women, so on and so forth. And so we're trying to, that's what we have been learning from other municipalities that are best practices. And also with some of the questions that we've come up with, those were some best um, practices as well from questions that were done by other municipalities in their surveys. Councilman Monday. I Thank you. I, I don't say this to be argumentative. I say it because I think maybe we should check, but 20% 
in my eyes, is a good response rate, and it's, quant it's a, a statistically significant for you. Now, if we had a, 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 you know, if we only had 50 employees, maybe not. But when you're in the hundreds, I think back to my quantitative methods class that I didn't do that well in. But it seems like that's a very significant uh, number, and. If I remember well from Haynes Brands, that's about what we got as well, unless you provide an incentive. So I do think it's enough to draw some conclusions um, and, and do some benchmarking maybe with other um, municipalities and, and our for-profit companies to make sure that that is normal. And if it's, if it's normal, I don't know how hard we want to work to get it higher, because 20 percent to me would, would tell me what I need to, to decide on a product in the past. Um, but then my follow-up question is, is much more difficult. Who is charged with addressing these? It seems way beyond the scope of, of human relations. Yes, it's in your court to, to, to do the survey, but so much of this is, is broad and it's got to come through human resources, it's got to come through the city manager's office. Are we putting together a, a next steps plan and will we see this same survey fielded after a period of time to see if the numbers improve. Absolutely. That's that that is the plan. Um, you know, the goal that I would have, which is a real a lofty goal, you know, uh, we have a company here in town, RJ Reynolds, Reynolds American, who scores very, very high in their DEI. Um, I mean, it, na nationally, internationally scores very high. I'm not sure we can get quite to their level, but I'd like to at least be somewhere near them. And, and so we've got a lot of work to do with HR, with all of our all of the management team and, and city council to see how we can become that employer of choice uh, where everybody feels comfortable. Thank you. Council Member Clark. Yeah, just one last comment. Uh, I, my concern with the 20 percent is my experience with voluntary surveys, the folks that are unhappy tend to reply versus the ones that are happy. Having said that, I, I think we can get out of the anecdotal type of surveys and just go do the numbers. What percent of, of uh, supervisors are this person, this person, this person? Um, and that, that'll answer the question. The city's 35% black, 15% Hispanic, and 50% white, roughly. What are our supervisors? What are our department heads? What are our whatever? Uh, and just, just to say, just give me the data. Mm -hmm. And Councilmember Clark, we're in the process actually of doing exactly that. We've started collecting information from human resources mm -hmm. um, that reflect exactly those demographics for department heads, for who's being promoted, yeah. what do those demographics look like, for people who have been disciplined or terminated, what do those demographics look like, all of those things. We're yeah, the, uh, the last comment, I would exclude retirees. I don't know how you define them, but I do know we have a... a 30 or 40, 50 people a year retire at least, uh, and I don't consider that a a bad omen. Those are people that have worked their 30 years or whatever and have, have moved on, but I'm talking about people that leave early as far as capturing that data. Right. Thank you. Thank you. I also kind of sort of want to apologize on behalf of the city council. Uh, when I got on the city council in 09, we were in a major recession. Uh, that we took us years to get to a level of comfort that we could remain, go back to some of the practices. Uh, we made up in our mind when jobs were being lost and other things were happening that our main goal was to protect the house. And then we had another recession and we had to do the same thing, just like this virus, over and over. So this is maybe three major episodes economically, Councilmember Clark and McIntosh, that we've seen in the past 10 plus. But one of the things I know that when we the first one hit, some hard decisions had to be made by this council as well as the city manager and staff, and that was where were we going to cut because the money wasn't there. And yes, we cut training and development and paper and everything that we could think of that we didn't need to survive right now. And on the back of that, employee salaries as well. 
But again, I know people think when we make these decisions, we make them in a vacuum, but they're very tough decisions when you're talking about people's life. So I'm hoping that uh, we are moving into a better place. Uh, we're working on better employee incentives and uh, swag to, to retain and, and hopefully get some new ones and some and, you know other things. But I thank you for this, and I'm looking forward to the follow-up, Ms. Pitt and Dr. Abraha and Mr. Garrity. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. If there is nothing else for the good of the order, community development meeting is adjourned.